Here, uh, the apostle, or, or the writer, could be the apostle Paul, we're not sure, but the writer of Hebrews uh, speaks of the Old Testament saints. Uh, he starts speaking about people that, and he spends time speaking about well-known people. And then he talks about lesser-known people like Gideon and Barak, especially people like Barak and Jephthah, maybe you've never heard of them. But then he goes and speaks of the people that are unsung heroes, people whose names we don't even know. If you compare uh, the, uh, what they, he speaks about these people, you come to find out that he's not just speaking of Gideon and Barak of Samson. He talks about people that have quenched the violence of fire, that escaped the edge of the sword, people that were sawn asunder, people that were uh, tempted, people that wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, that were tormented, afflicted, destitute, of whom the world was not worthy, who faced mocking and scourgings. Of course, he's talking about Old Testament saints. But if you read the description, it can describe even New Testament Christians, people of the New Testament faith, people that were persecuted during the New Testament age, and people that were persecuted even in, during the Rome, Roman Empire. They were thrown to the lions. So it speaks of many Christians throughout the church age over the centuries, those intrepid, daring Christians who witnessed of the Lord and lived a life for the Lord in spite of hardships. I think of several like the Waldenses, people of the 12th century. They were called the people of the Bible. Uh, some, uh, one time, uh, uh, people were, uh, were sent, uh, young men, young seminary students, graduates were sent from Paris to try to persuade the Waldenses to return back to the Catholic faith. And, and, the, and the people, the, those seminary students came back bewildered because the children of the Waldenses knew more of the Scripture than they even knew. They're called the people of the Bible. They lived in the Alps, hid in the Alps because they refused to baptize their babies. And because of that, they had to hide in the Alps, in the valleys of the Alps. In fact, they're called the Waldenses. According to one of them, uh, we're, we're named the Waldenses because we live in the Vale of Tears. But in spite of that, in spite of the persecution, they would walk out of the Alps into a district called Albi. And in spite of the danger, they would preach to the people two by two, just like we do today. And many were saved because of that. They evangelized Europe, steeped in spiritual darkness in their generation, and turned the generation from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. I think of the Anabaptists several centuries later, in the 16th century. They gave their lives to preach the gospel. Once again, amidst persecution, they spread the gospel from Switzerland, to, from France to Moravia. In spite of the persecution, in spite of the fact that there was a, a, a line, a, a road that would go to Rome with, with, with pikes along the road, with heads of Anabaptists on top of those pikes. They would take the Anabaptists and they would, for example, they would just uh, fill a, a, a Christian, uh, their, their, their mouth full of dynamite and light it just to see what would happen, or gunpowder back in those days. And in spite of that, these unsung heroes of missionary endeavor reached Europe, Central Europe. In fact, they reached Europe so much that a cardinal, uh, in, in a council of trend, a cardinal, Hoseus, I think it was his name, but he was a Catholic cardinal. He said, if it wasn't for, the, uh, for 1,500 years, we have uh, killed a Baptist with a knife. They would swarm Europe more than all of the reformers. That's how, that's how our, our forefathers, our Baptist forefathers, how much they, they, they preached the gospel and the effect they had in Europe in spite of the dangers. I think of the Moravians, a small church in Herhut in northern Germany, who within 65 years saw almost 300 missionaries leave their church. Missionaries that would go to the West Indies, some of them, where 20 out of 29 would die trying to reach the slaves of the West Indies. The first two that went were Johann Dober and David Nietzschemann. They wanted to go to an island in the West Indies, but the owner wouldn't let them go. He said, I'll have none of that nonsense. So to reach them, they sold themselves as slaves to reach the 3,000 slaves on that island. The history says that uh, when they took off on a ship to go to the West Indies, there in Hamburg, on the port of Hamburg in Germany, family members were emotional, weeping, was their extreme sacrifice wise? The housings had been cast off and were curled up on the pier. As the ship slipped away with the tide and the gap widened, the young men linked arms, raised their hands, and shouted across the spreading gap, May the lamb that was slain! 
be rewarded for his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That became the slogan of the Waldenses. What does that actually mean? Turn with me to Isaiah 53 and we'll see what that means. In this saying, I see the motivation of these unsung heroes of missionary endeavor. We see the motivation of the heroes throughout the centuries. In Isaiah chapter 53, we see Isaiah speaking of the Lamb that would come. Jesus Christ, in verse 7, he writes, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is bought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. Obviously, he's speaking of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He writes in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to bruise his son. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his offering, uh, his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Speaking of how Jehovah God the Father would see the travail of his son would be satisfying, knowing of the souls that would be saved. But first of all, his wrath satisfied, his wrath against sin placated by the blood of the Lamb. But also, I believe it, it, it could speak of Jesus Christ, the travail of his soul. Would, uh, in spite of the travail of his soul, he would be satisfied knowing that because of the travail of his soul, uh, millions would be saved of every kindred tongue and nation would be saved in the future. That's why the Waldenses said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. They wanted to reward the lamb for the suffering that he, that he had to, to, to uh, uh, experience for their salvation. Turn with me to Revelations chapter 5. Revelations chapter 5. While you're turning there, let me just read what, it, what we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was his joy? How was he able to endure the cross? Because he knew that there would be a reward for his suffering. And what the Waldenses wanted to do is they wanted to reward Christ for his suffering. They, wanted, they, wanted, they, they were so filled with the love of Christ and, and what the Lamb had done for them and so filled with thankfulness, they wanted to reward him. Verse 9 speaks of the Lamb as well, and it says, And they sung a new song, speaking of how the Lamb was worthy. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou hast slain, thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the tongue. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, and redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and every tongue, people and nation, that is reward of his suffering. Soul saved. Souls redeemed by his blood from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. That should be our motivation. That the Lamb of God receive his reward. That founder of the Moravian church, Zinzendorf, one day after he graduated from college, he was just a young man. He went to a museum and he saw a painting. He saw a painting suffering, uh, of Christ suffering on the cross. Now, I'm sure that painting was nothing like the real suffering of Christ, but it was enough to move him. He was moved, and he thought, as he looked upon that scene, as he looked upon his Savior dying for the sins of men, he said these words, he thought these words, these wounds were meant to purchase me. These drops of blood were shed to obtain me. And it spoke to his heart. As he saw the lamb dying there for his sins, shedding his blood for his sins, you can't look upon God with spiritual eyes on, and to the lamb and not be moved. And not be moved to do something. That's why Isaiah, when he saw the Lord standing there in the temple, he said, here am I, send me. I think of what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well-known verse, all of us know it. But many times, sadly, we forget it. That's why Paul, you know, we forget what God has done for us. We forget what the Lamb did for us. That's why Paul had to say, what? Don't you remember? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We are bought with a price. We are bought with the blood of the Lamb. 
We need to remember that. We forget it. Some people ask me when I'm in Mexico, you know, sometimes Mexican people ask me, they just wonder, you know, there's a, of course, there's a great difference of standard of living between here and, and, and Mexico. And they'll ask me, do you really like it here in Mexico? And people even in the States, do you really like it there in Mexico? You know, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. I'm not there because I like it. I'm not going to tell you whether I like it or not. You can talk to me afterwards about that. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You don't do what you like to do. That's what I, The Christian life isn't about doing what we like to do. It's all about God, not about us. He bought us. I am not my own. I'm there because I am not my own. God told me to go there because, I'm, because he told me I'm there because he bought me with his blood. I'm bought with a price. I can't do what I want to do. And you can't do what you want to do. You've been bought with a price. That's what motivated the Waldenses. That's what's motivated every unsung hero that has entered into the missionary endeavor, whether it's reaching their town or reaching the other side of the world. That's what needs to be our motivation, the lamb. Not only a vision of the lamb that they had, but also a vision of the lost. Now, it's primarily the vision of the lamb because our love for the lost can wane, especially when you get stabbed in the back so many times, amen? But it's the love of the lamb, but it's also the love of the lost. We got to have a love for the lost. We got to have a vision of the lost. Jesus has a vision of the lost. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. Proverbs, we can't discount a vision for the lost that all of us need to have. We need to have it because Jesus has it. And if he has it, and if we're good Christians, we'll have it too. Proverbs 15, verse 11. You can't, let, you can't have the word of God living within you richly. You can't let God dwell in you richly without having the same vision that he has. The verse says here, and the, uh, Proverbs 15, 11 says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. Now, we got a lot of things before us. You know, we have the cares of this world, and I preach a message on that, the cares of this world, and we can't discount that. We've got, after all, I've got kids to take care of. I've got bills to pay. I've got kids I want to give a good education to. There's so many things I'm trying to get done in this life for, the, for my family. And those things can come before us, but there's one thing that's always before the Lord, whether it's before us or not. It's hell and destruction. They're always before the Lord. People falling into that abyss, into that river of lava, he sees it every day, and it breaks his heart. As he sees people go, falling there in Mexico City, I'm sure every hour with a city of that size, there are people falling into hell every hour. And in the world, every minute, even in here in this county, every day, I'm sure the county of this size, there's someone falling into hell today. And it breaks God's heart, and it ought to break our heart as well. Bible says as well in Proverbs 27, Proverbs 27, verse 20. Not only is hell and destruction before the Lord, but the Bible says in verse 20, hell and destruction are never full. I love that song. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Amen? At the cross. But let me tell you, in hell, though millions have gone, there's still room for many more. And they're falling into hell by the thousands, every year by the millions. Hell and destruction are never full. There's always room for one more, and God sees that, and it breaks his heart. Does it break your heart? And not only is to see the, the lost falling into hell, but to see the lost living miserable lives all around us. Turn with, Matthew, to, with me to Matthew chapter 9. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went from village to village to village to village with weary feet. And I'm sure if he's preaching like we preach, a sore throat as well. But he did it because he loved people. He went about all the cities and villages in verse 35, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And you need to remember in this moment, in his ministry, there was no one else. It wasn't until the next chapter that he calls his 
12 disciples. They were just disciples at the time. They were just sitting at his feet. There was no one else preaching, just him. John the Baptist was already in jail. He had to do it all. And he saw the multitude, knowing that he was doing it all. There was no one else. He saw the multitude. He saw the great need, and he was moved with compassion on them. As he saw all of them, the thousands in front of them, needy people, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Man, I think of that. What time I'm out there in the Kalpan? You know, I try, I try to show it there. That, you know, just you see a ridge there of tens of thousands of homes. Most of them not even painted because they never could afford to put the paint on there, on their homes. They, they built the homes with their bare hands. Tens of thousands of homes on a ridge, and then there's a dip, and then you'll see tens of thousands of other homes, and then there's a dip, and then tens of thousands of other homes, t hundreds of thousands of people, with representing bro most of them broken homes, sadly. Sadly, I drive through those neighborhoods, up and down those ridges, and I see the young people completely lost, completely lost. You go to the, not just the high schools, the junior high, See young people completely lost. Girls there hanging on to some bum because she doesn't have any security. You know why? Because her, her mom didn't have any security because she was raised without a father. And then she looks for security in whatever person she can find. Some bum out there who leaves her after three, three four children. And then that little girl is raised up without a father with no security. And she, she does the same thing, finds some garbage fellow out there who just sees her for what he can get out of her. And then the same thing, generation after generation, it's going to stay that way. And there's, there's someone to break the chains. The only one that can do that is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why they need to be reached. Lost, scattered, broken homes. Think of that verse, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. It's going to continue that way. As someone has a vision for the lost, goes to tell them about the Lord. We, we as missionaries show, we try to show a little bit of what it's like on the mission field so that your eye can see it, and we hope that your eye affecteth your heart. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? That's what I think of when I see the slide present, the video. The harvest has passed, the Bible says. You know, there's that song, so little time. The harvest fields are not only reaped, they're wasting. They're wasting. The harvest has passed, the summer has entered, ended, and we are not saved. Think of that verse in Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. We need to find them. We need to reach them. It's, it's, for many of them, it's already too late. It's almost, if it's not, it's almost too late. You know, young people, if we don't get them, pretty soon those drugs just blow their mind and they can't even understand the gospel. And I believe that's what Satan wants to do. He's doing that not just in Mexico City. He's doing it right here, right around us. We need to reach them before it's too late. A lot of times you have people walking around alive, but they're dead already. And it's sad. Now to break our hearts. It breaks Christ's heart. Does it break your heart? The vision of the lost. Proverbs 24 says in verse 11, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth our heart consider it? When I read that where it says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, I think of those people that are dragged to hell by the angels, kicking and screaming. If thou sayest, behold, we knew it not. We, we didn't know. I mean, I had a family to take care of. I mean, I had bills to pay. I've got a lot on my plate. I've got a lot of things going on. Does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? He's considering. If we forget about it, he's considering. And he's considering our attitude towards it as well. We need to get a vision of the lamb and a, and a vision of the loss. I think sometimes it's blurred. It's blurred. Our vision's blurred because of the cares of this world. 
Got to take care of my family. Of course you got to take care of my family. But you know what? The unsaved take care of their family. Isn't what the Bible says? Think not how, you, how you'll eat or drink or, take, or clothe your family. That's what the Gentiles seek, don't they? they? They seek the same thing. We need to seek more than just that. Of course you need to take care of your family. But seek ye first in the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Isn't that what the Bible says? We've got a lost world to take care of. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? The hero's motivation. But how about the hero's legacy? Turn with me to Psalm. This verse got a hold of my heart this year. What a great promise here. But what also a great challenge. Psalm 110, verse, verse 3. Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Wow, in the day of the power of God in churches, people will be willing. That's what we need to pray for, amen? The power of God. That's the power that we had in the 19th century, and that's why there's so many missionaries in the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, went out from churches around America because there was power in the pulpit. There was power in the churches, and people were willing. But I believe it's time for the power of God again, and it's time that people be willing. Psalm 110.3, thy people shall be willing. And the people were willing in that day. Now I want to not just speak of the hero's motivation, but the hero's legacy. And let me just read about some of those unsung heroes. I'm sure you've never heard these names. But I want you to hear about their actions. In 1833 in Sumatra, Sumatra is an island out there in Indonesia, Lyman and Samuel Munson from the Congregational Church, after they learned Chinese and Malayan, they went to the Sumatra where the Batak cannibals, thinking they were spies, killed them and ate them. In 1796, 19 missionaries got off a boat onto the shores of the Tahiti where a cannibal king was waiting for them, Palmari. Three of those 19 missionaries were killed and others left. Four years later, only seven of those 19 missionaries were left. The others were either killed or couldn't take it anymore. But people in the London Missionary Society back in London poured out their soul in prayer victorious. And that Pamari II, the, the son's chief, or the chief's son, I'm sorry, destroyed his idols and was baptized. But that wouldn't have happened if those missionaries would have stayed on there on the mission field in spite of hardships. Just a few miles off from Tahiti, 10 other missionaries went to Tonga. Three of the missionaries were killed. One was converted to a native. I don't know how that happened. The others picked up and set sail to Australia. But this is the part I want you to hear. Those experiences stirred the Australian Methodists to send more missionaries. Did you hear that? To send more missionaries because people were willing in the day of power. And when they heard of the sacrifice of others, they said, that's where we want to go. And by 1830, the chief there also was baptized. And, and the gospel was established on that island, but it would have never happened if people weren't going, gone. People hadn't gone in the second wave to replace those that went in the first, first wave. In 1828, it was said of the Samoans, of the American Samoans. Well, back then, it was just the Samoans before it became part of America. It's an island there in the middle of the Pacific. It is doubtful that there has been another people that in proportion to their numbers have provided so many missionaries or have paid such a price in sacrifice and martyrdom. I hope you're listening. I hope this isn't just statistics and names. Think about what I'm saying. Think about what, 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 what we're hearing today. These were real people who gave their lives, unsung heroes of missionary endeavor. In the New Hebrid Islands, John Williams and James Harris explored the island of Eramanga. Some cannibals attacked them and dragged them half dead to the interior of the jungle without a doubt in preparation of a feast. Listen to this. When the news of the death of Williams and Harris came to Samoa, 25 Christians offered to God to go to Eramanga as missionaries to that dangerous place where two men were eating. They said, that's where we want to go. 
No less than five of them sacrificed their lives before the gospel was established on that island, but it was established on that island. If you'd go there today, you would find on Sunday thousands of people going to churches. Now, they may not even be saved. They may just be religious because they're, after all, the descendants of those Christians. And we know what happens. Formalism takes over, but at least they're not eating people, are they? They're going to worship God but they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't be worshiping, worshiping God if there weren't people that were willing to face the hardships. I think of others. In the Solomon Islands, John Coleridge Patterson traveled with two others to, the island of, uh, to, to some islands, and then he went to the island of Nikapu by himself. The natives killed him, put him in a canoe, stirred, steered the canoe toward the ship where other missionaries awaited Patterson. His body was covered with a palm leaf and five lances penetrating his chest. In 1895, seven missionaries came to Kenya, Africa, headed by Peter Cameron Scott. Fourteen months later, Scott died. The last entry in his diary said, Here am I, Lord. Use me in life or death. The last of the seven missionaries, too weak to continue, returned home. But other missionaries came to replace them. There are always other missionaries willing to face the danger, face the hardship, face the fevers. That's the kind of people we're looking for today. That's the kind of people God is looking for today. That's the kind of people D.L. Moody was looking for. <laughs> the leaders of a missionary society once wrote to, DL, uh, to, to I'm sorry, David Livingston, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. And he wrote back, if you have men who only come if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. That's the kind of missionaries we had back in those days. And I'm afraid there's a lot of young people that won't go to the mission field unless there's a good road waiting for them. The Christian Missionary Alliance arrived in Mali in 1923. The work received new life. Listen to this. The work received new life when three of the missionaries died of yellow fever in one week. Twenty young people, when they heard of their testimony, presented themselves for service to replace them. They said, you know what? That's where we want to go. Where those three guys went, we're willing to go. We may die of fever, but we're going. I tell you all these stories for a reason. I hear so many t people say, man, how could you go to Mexico? Man, there's cartels there, and man, there's, it's dangerous. And it is true. After Syria, they say the second most conflictive nation in, in the world is Mexico. Praise God, not so much in Mexico City. We have our regular crime. We don't have the cartels. We have other things. You know, uh, two people in our church, uh, two people in our teachers in our school, one of them now is married to the fellow that's preaching, so she doesn't have to travel. But both of them used to travel from, uh, from our old church, from the suburbs, to our church to teach in our Christian school. I don't know how many times they, they, they were robbed on the way you know, uh, on the public transportation, people just get on a bus and shake everyone down. And, you know, I, uh, one of them, uh, he's on his third cell phone that's been stolen from him, you know, since uh, uh, Mexico City. I'm not saying it's an easy place to live. My wife, uh, they tried to put tape. Uh, came, a fella came to our house uh, several years ago and tried to put tape on my wife's mouth. And, you know, she uh, she fought him off. And uh, then he ran out, ran out, grabbed her purse on the way out and I was out in the patio when my wife chased after him, and they struggled for the purse for a while until he finally let go and, and ran right towards the police because someone had called the police, heard the screams, and police were there waiting for, her, for him, and he had the gall to say, she's trying to rob me. <laughs> I'm not saying Mexico City is an easy place to live, but people hear these stories, and they say, well, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. You know, I, I, I know what I... I I've never, I never had been assaulted until a couple years ago. I didn't know what I would, how I would react. And, and six, four guy, well, I thought it was a young person I knew. He was a teenager, and he had this, you know, sunglasses on. All four, three of his friends, other friends had sunglasses on. They had a skull cap on their head and, and uh, backpacks. And I thought I knew him. I thought he was a kid that used to go to VBS, a military, son, a military guy, a soldier's son that I, I, I thought I knew him. And, uh, and I was going to shake his hand even until he pulled the knife and showed it to me. And all four of them did a semicircle suddenly around me. And, and I don't know, I, I, didn't, I never thought how I'd interact. What I said was, I, probably stupid what I said, but I said, you can prick me with that knife, but you're not going to take my money. I only had like three bucks on me. 
uh, end up knocking his glasses off. I don't know, it's just a reaction that I had. Knocked his glasses off, broken, and all four of them looked at each other, went running away. And, and um, my daughter was hiding behind a tree. She said, Dad, there wasn't four of them. She said this years later, Dad, there wasn't four. There was two behind you. There were six of them. Maybe if I knew there was two behind me, I wouldn't have been so brave. I don't know. But, but people hear stories like that and say, I'm not going to go to the mission field. I'm not going to go there. That's not what they did. They said, that's the place we want to go. Where's that daring, intrepid Christians of the past? We don't want to be inconvenienced nowadays. We don't want to suffer. Let me, let me read you something here that this is something that um, Theodore Roosevelt was talking about Americans in America, but I believe we can, it, it, we can apply it to Christianity. Just think about it, in the kingdom of God. Christianity means the virtues of courage, honor, justice, Truth, sincerity, and hardlyhood. Isn't that what isn't that what Christianity means? Isn't it? Virtue? Courage, shouldn't we be courageous as Christians? Honor, justice, truth, sincerity, and hardlyhood. The virtues advance the kingdom of God. Now he said America, but think about it. The virtues advance the kingdom of God, and the things that will impede the advance of the kingdom of God are prosperity at any price. Peace at any price. Safety first instead of duty first. The love of soft living and the get-rich-quick theory of life. Isn't that what we have among young people today? Hopefully not in this church, but in a lot of churches. That's why we don't have people going to the, getting in the Bible Institute or getting into Bible colleges today. I'm not saying that anyone's called in the ministry, but I believe there should be a whole lot more. Because there sure is a great need. I'm not saying anyone, everyone who goes to Bible college should go to the mission field, but I believe a whole lot more should be going than are going. I think of, I think of a song, a song that we sing all the time. You know, the songs of the 19th century, especially, weren't songs like nowadays. Nowadays, you have just artists that are thinking, what, what kind of song would make the most money for me? Christian artists. Back then, they came out of revivals. They came of, out of the heart and soul of the writers who experienced revival in their own lives. And in those days of revival and missionary fervor, there was a song that was written. And the, and the fourth verse goes like this, Give of thy sons to bear the message glorious. Wow, that's a lot different from today. You're not taking my, to my grandkids to the mission field. We hear that today. I've heard it personally. Give of thy sons to bear the message glorious. Give of thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out, thy, their, your, pour out thy soul for them in prayer victorious. Like the London Missionary Society that saw that island, that, 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 that chief changed because of their prayers. Then it continues. Pour out thy soul for them in prayer victorious, and all that thou spendest, Jesus will repay. Where's that missionary spirit? Where's that interpret, intrepid spirit? You know, a lot of us are sons of pioneers. I, I, I go around here and I see all these German names. Amen. <laughs> German pioneers, a lot, of, a lot of you are probably sons of these pioneers whose names are on these streets and on the names of cities and things. They had to go through a lot to build America, didn't they? They were, they were willing to do that. They had an intrepid, daring spirit. Our forefathers. Where's that spirit today, young people? Huh? Where's that spirit today? The hero's legacy. And last of all, the hero's replacements. Turn with me to Hebrews. We'll finish. The hero's replacements. We need young people that have vision. A vision of the lost. And old people. A vision of the lost. A vision of the lamb. Think of a person, a man in my church who has that vision that propels him even though he's, uh, he has 19,000 policemen under him there in Mexico City, Joel Pichardo, even though he only gets like four hours of sleep because of his responsibilities, I've seen him knocking doors with his bodyguard with him, his unsaved bodyguard with him, knocking doors. A lot of times he doesn't have time to go knocking doors, so he just says, give me a street, and when I get a chance, I'll go there and knock doors, and there's his bodyguard knocking doors with him with a patrol police car following him from door to door. But why does he do that? Because he has a vision of the lamb and a vision of the lost. Why did a young, ca uh, an old captain, a fellow retired captain of the army, why would he on his deathbed when he thought he was dying be talking, instead of worrying about where he was going to die and go, he was calling on a cell phone 
telling his son how to be saved. Because he has a vision of the lamb and the lost. The hero's replacements. Hebrews chapter 12, you're there. I'm going to get there. Verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, those intrepid heroes of the faith are now in heaven. When well, we know that, Pastor. The Bible says they're a great cloud of witnesses. They're looking down at us. They're looking down at us. They reached their generation. They did the hard thing. They suffered hardships to reach their generation. What are we doing? They're looking down at us. What do they think of us? What do they think of us? What do we think of when, when God touches the heart of one of us to say, I want you to go to the mission field and we're too scared to go because maybe our girlfriend wouldn't marry us if we'd go, amen? Or your wife? Or you're just too scared to go? I was that way until I heard a message, God's grace is sufficient for thee, amen? I said, faithful, and faithful is he which has called you, who also will do it. And I said, God, you're going to have to do it. I don't know what's holding you back. I'm not saying that everyone's called to the mission field, but I believe there should be a lot more going, going than, than is going. Because there was a great need. Mexico City, 20 million people. Suburbs of 2 million people with only one gospel preaching church for 2 million people. I mean, that's more than a lot of countries have. No one reached them. You can't tell me that there's not more people that should be going. And I think probably even here, there's somebody here. Somebody, God wants them to go. And they're fighting it. Let me read something else that Roosevelt said that I think you can talk about when you talk about an intrepid Christian, the credit belongs to the intrepid Christian who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. Oh, I hope there's no cold and timid souls here that just because the mission field could be a place of hardship, you would not go. I hope there's no one here who God is calling that would say, well, I would go if it wasn't for the danger because I'll make less money. Because I won't be able to have that great American dream that I've always dreamed about, that television and the billboards and, and, and everyone is saying that I ought to have. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where we're supposed to have the great American dream. I don't see that here. Now it's good if God blesses us, amen? But you know what, what really matters is to do the will of God, whether you have material blessings or not. The Bible says that a harvest is past. They are not saved. Maybe God's calling you. Maybe God's speaking to your heart. Wherefore, seeing we also compass about so great a cloud of witnesses, they're watching. They're watching you from above. They're looking to see who's going to step up, who's going to take our place. I love that verse. The people were willing in the day of power. I hope to think that the day of power has come to this church. I look to see I, and see all that this church is doing. And that's why I like to preach message, messages like this. And I can preach them with confidence because I believe the power of God is working in this church. And I believe there are people that are willing, willing to dare to do the difficult. It may be just right here. But think about a young person or even older person, maybe across the seas. This is the day of power. Are you willing? Thank you for joining us by way of the internet today. We're so glad that you were able to be with us and we pray that the service was a blessing to your heart. Even though the sermon is over, our service is not over. 
at the end of our service, we give an opportunity for people to respond and come to an altar and pray over what God dealt with them about. Sometimes people come to call upon Christ and to be saved. Others come to make a decision for Christ regarding their Christian lives. Others come to call out to the Lord about special needs and situations in their lives. Maybe God has dealt with you today about some specific area of your life. I invite you to make an altar right there in your home, a quiet time before the Lord where you pray to Him and respond to Him about what He has spoken to you about. If you made a decision for the Lord today, we would be glad to hear about that decision and or answer any questions you have today about the message that was preached. You can contact us by way of email at info at mountziononline.org or by way of phone at 717-927-9227. Again, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to you joining us again for our live stream weekly on Sundays at 1045 a.m. and on Sunday evenings at 645 p.m. If we can meet a need in your life, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you, and God bless you.